And here we go. I think we're live. Yep, there we are. All right. Welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Dustin Seaton. I'm the gifted and talented specialist at the Northwest Arkansas Education Service Cooperative. Uh, and I'm president of Arkansans for Gifted and Talented Education, or AGIT. Uh, AGIT is an organization that encourages the development uh, and the implementation of educational programs and initiatives throughout the state, especially when it comes to serving and identifying the gifted and talented youth of Arkansas. Uh, you can check out our website for more information at agitarkansas.org. Tonight's panel uh, is meant to listen and promote diverse voices and ideas for closing the equity gap in many of our state's gifted programs. Uh, we will not solve the problem tonight, we realize that, but hopefully we can start the dialogue and the conversation and continuing the ongoing awareness in, the, in various ways to do so. Uh, we realize many school districts have a gap in traditionally underrepresented students between their uh, total student population and that of its identified gifted population that it serves. And this is especially true by race across the state. Uh, it is from that framework that Agate wants to be intentional and thoughtful by supporting districts and ways to address this problem. So tonight's panel is just one way we want to help and, uh, in that process. So we hope you that are tuning in from home, our attendees, can um, work on with your students and in your community to promote empathy and awareness uh, and bring back some of these various viewpoints from our panelists tonight in hopes that we can achieve greater understanding and equity in our state's gifted and talented programs. So I encourage you to sit back and listen from wherever you are. Feel free to, and comfortable to use the Q&A feature at the bottom if you would like to ask any of our panelists a question. The chat box is also available for you if you have any questions uh, or sorry, resources, links, or want to just make additional comments. But with that said, I'm proud to turn it over to the program to our moderator tonight and fellow Agate board member, Mrs. Jennifer Thomas. Hello. My name is Jennifer Thomas and I am the secondary GT coordinator for Little Rock School District and I also work at Dunbar Middle School. And I hope that everyone can take what Mr. Seaton mentioned today and actually use it in their classrooms and in different situations that they encounter daily. Racism is an emotionally explosive word and one that believe that some schools systems, they have rejected it as a serious problem. And with that being said, um, diversity and inclusion has been championed. And the reality is that many people, including African American and Hispanic teachers and students, oftentimes do not receive the same access to education and other opportunities as other races because of structures that have been created and passed down for years. And that's one reason why we wanted to have this panel discussion. Um, different people come from different walks of life, have had different experiences, and we know that we can learn from everybody's experiences. And just one person may have had access when another person may not have had access to the educational opportunity. So as we talk today, we do want to let you know that we understand that is it is a different case for a different individual, but as a whole, it is a problem that we want to discuss and we welcome our panel discussion members. Uh, we hope that the discussion today will offer insight on how to speak to students in a productive way when school starts back. We know that different conversations will occur about Black Lives Matter, and we know that um, students may have questions for their teachers about how they should feel or how they should treat their peers. And we just want to open that discussion up so that teachers can feel comfortable and work with, like if you have any questions in the Q&A, please, please feel free. And if we can't answer your question, we will try to send you a link or get with you after our panel discussion as well. So I would like to introduce everyone on the panel. Let's begin with Mr. Love and then with Ms. McCoy. And if you guys would just kind of introduce yourselves and tell us about what you do and how it relates to education. Okay, well, I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Frederick Love. Uh, I am in my fifth term in the Arkansas legislature. I do not sit on the educational committee, even though I do get to vote on those policies and weigh in. Um, as it relates to education, I'm really uh, interested in, in the adequacy discussion. Um, also, in my other full-time role, because, you know, they say the legislature is part-time, but it's never part-time. Um, I do serve as the director of, of, uh, of uh, community services for Pulaski County government where 
I oversee an EPA program for brownfields, and that's a reclamation program for uh, land that has been, um, I would say, misused. Uh, I also serve as an executive director for a housing agency, so I really, uh, I really do service our families, and I see children that are in great need. So uh, these are just a few things that that you know I do, and as it relates to, you know, uh, I would say my part in giving back to the community. I want to thank you all for having this timely discussion because I think uh, it is something that we need to, the a discussion that is, is far past due, but something that I, uh, I can shed a little light on because uh, I was talented and gifted when I was in, in junior high and through my high school years and so I have a perspective, and then also I have a child in the Little Rock School District who is a talented and gifted student as well. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Ms. Booth McCoy. Hello, my name is Amber Booth McCoy. Um, first and foremost, I'm a mother of two boys in the Little Rock School District, um, one of which is in um, pre-AP because he is going to high school. So bear with me while I get emotional. Um, I am a senior diversity specialist at UAMS. So I also oversee our um, Academy for Inclusive Excellence. Um, I am the CEO of the diversity booth. And so that allows me to work with organizations across the state and across the nation in regards to their diversity, equity, and inclusion ideas, initiatives, strategic thinking. Um, I am a former uh, gifted and talented, you know, student. So there's, I have my perspective there, my AP experience. And I also oversee and created the Junior STEM Academy and the Senior STEM Academy at UAMS, which is our K through sixth grade program and our sixth through eighth grade program, um, which is STEM programming designed, a culturally proficient program designed for those students, uh, those underrepresented minorities. Thank you, Ms. Stanley, and then Hi. Dr. Neal. My name is Kristen Stanley. I am the Director of Education at the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. Um, as the Director of Education, it's my job to um, create and um, to promote the programming at the museum, um, as well as create teacher resources and do teacher trainings. Um, I'm also a product of a GT, <laughs> you know, curriculum and took AP classes myself. Um, unfortunately, not in Arkansas. I uh, came from Indiana, but I'm sure it's the same the country over, so. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Yes, so I'm Karama Neal. Um, I am a product of the Little Rock School District, also the GT education. Um, my daughter is also in Little Rock School District and participates in GT. And so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, part of, I think, the perspective I bring in addition to that is that, um, you know, my husband is a teacher and so, and, and teaches at a, at a, frankly, a low resource, low wealth school. And so it's interesting to hear some of the comparisons and see some of the work, some of what happens at his school compared to, frankly, what happens at my daughter's school, um, what the opportunities are for gifted and talented education, what that looks like in different places. Um, also, I'm a former teacher. So I taught for one year at the Arkansas School for Mathematics and Sciences. And while that was, it was intended to be a one-year experience and I loved it, um, I think it, it actually, sh it, it's relevant for this, it's this conversation as well because of how, particularly because it was the first year that it operated because of how it drew from schools across the state. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that particularly in this time of when students have been at home, I've been doing for my own daughter some educational enrichment activities that I've shared through Facebook and other resources that it's been interesting to see how those have been received and what's, what parents in fact are needing as they think about how to make sure that their, their students are properly enriched and properly engaged, um, not just during uh, the times of school year, but even in the summer as well. Thank you. Ms. Shemple and then Ms. Fletcher. Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Ramona Shinnable. I am the Director of Gifted Programming for the Little Rock School District. Um, and of course, um, my interest in tonight's session is to gain insight and perspective as we continue our work in the state of Arkansas to assure that we are differentiating and meeting the needs of all of our students, and especially those that come from underrepresented populations. It is an ongoing work and we still have work to do in this area. So I am so interested in, in all the perspectives and information that to be shared and um, just uh, thank you guys for asking me to join. 
Ms. Fletcher. Hi, my name is Keith Fletcher. I am the Deputy Director at Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, and um, I oversee um, a lot of the day-to-day -day operations uh, of, the, of the museum, as we know that as our state-funded African-American Museum of History and Culture. Um, as many of you also said, I am a, a mother. I am a president of my daughter's PTO, so I for sure bring that to the table. I was not in GT, <laughs> believe it or not. I was actually asked and I turned it down in third grade. I was asked again in middle school um, and I turned it down again. Um, I don't think my kid will be in GT either, but that's okay. <laughs> She's a hard worker and, and makes amazing grades. Um, also, I wanna say that um, I also bring to the table, because um, I wear many hats, I am an organizer with the Greater Little Rock Organizing Committee, uh, while we work to make sure um, that families um, have a voice in, in, in what happens with us, with ourselves in our daily lives um, and community as well. So thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you. And then we have Mr. Seaton, who I think he says he'll pass on introducing himself a little bit more. Would you have any last words to say about his introduction? I do uh, want to welcome on, on our attendees. We do have members from uh, the Department of Education. We have excellent leadership there under Crystal Nell, Amanda Peebles, and Connie Story. Some of them are in our attendance. But we also have students attending the first ever Arkansas Governor's School uh, virtually. So we're, we're, we have a few of those students I know in the attendance uh, area. So welcome and thank y'all for joining us. Yes, thank you. Okay, we will go ahead and begin. And I just know this is going to be interesting and it's going to be so educational. Um, our first question deals with underrepresentation of African Americans and Hispanics. So it is a well-known nationwide problem and that gifted and talented programs across the country um, do not have a high number of African Americans and Hispanics. So we want to talk about how can GT specialists and teachers be cognizant of talented students in their classroom, especially if the student does not fit the quote unquote mold of a traditional GT student. Um, you can answer that from a perspective of what else could a GT student look like besides the 99th percentile on a standardized test. Um, we'll start with Ms. Shinnable. Okay, well, you know, in the Little Rock School District, um, we have an ongoing effort of really looking at our gifted population as it compares to our school populations in each of our campuses. And so we've really been working on focusing on uh, our K-2 enrichment to help identify those babies when they come to us with great potential and to help build those skills and offer them those opportunities to build those, um, um, I guess you could say experiences. Um, so they have that opportunity to develop their creative thinking and their critical thinking skills. Um, and so as it relates to this question and just helping our staff also understand that process and what to look for, um, with traditional characteristics in gifted kids, we're obviously looking for those characteristics that align with our state definition for giftedness, which is a three-part definition based on Renzulli's triad, and uh, which, inc which you guys know, it includes uh, the creativity, the task commitment, and the academic abilities of students. And so those are the three areas that we typically look at. But sometimes we forget that students that appear to maybe be behavioral issues in the classroom or not behaving, they may be acting out because they're bored. Or um, maybe in some of our students, uh, if you have a child that just seems to be really bossy, that could be an indicator um, that they're, they actually have a lot of leadership potential, um, but it could be misconstrued differently. Um, so just raising that awareness with our staff and also with parents who are, who are working with their children at home. Who knows best? Who knows their children best but their, but their parents? And sometimes those negative characteristics that we see in students are actually positive things. We just need to put a spin on it and channel those in the right direction. And so I think that is so true, uh, especially building our cultural awareness with our um, African-American population and our Hispanic population. With our Hispanic children, I've been an elementary principal um, as part of my career. And um, uh, with our Hispanic population, some of those children can be so quiet they don't speak up. They don't speak a lot because, of, of course, in many cases, a language barrier. So you have to be aware of those things in, in working with, with our uh, Hispanic population. Um, and then again, 
uh, we're constantly looking for ways to build our awareness and um, just be more culturally aware of those challenges that students face and helping them build um, the skills that they need. And I mentioned that, you know, that K-2 enrichment is so important and as we go in and observe students in the classroom and trying to build their skill sets and provide opportunities for them to showcase that creative thinking or even just their ability to solve uh, critically. Um, sometimes that shows up in different ways than on a piece of paper on a test. So I'll, I'll send it back to you, Jennifer. All right. Um, as you were speaking, I just thought about, um, so oftentimes that K2 experience actually is the, it is the first exposure for a lot of students on critical thinking or analogies or the other things that we look for. So I just really want to kind of send that out into the atmosphere that when you cancel those sessions or when you do not value those sessions or teachers do not participate with the GT specialist in those sessions, you could be doing a disservice to the students if they are not actively participating in that regularly, especially with, you know, things going on with COVID, um, stuff like that has been canceled or may not have as much of merit of, of importance right now, but that is the student's first exposure. Um, would any of our other panelists like to speak on that about the student not fitting the mold, how to look at students? Yes, Ms. Fletcher? Well, not necessarily the fact of the student being the mold, mold um, but I think, uh, for instance, both of the times that I was identified, I was identified by um, teachers of color for GT, and I think we all know definitely that the lack of representation of um, teachers of color is for sure a problem only about, I think, right now it's 80% of teachers that are entering are white. And so, um, um, as she pointed out, definitely um, being aware of um, the cultural differences. And so, even having continued, con I think it has to be on the districts to ha continue to have those conversations and those lessons and those trainings with teachers, because let's be honest, the 80% majority of teachers being white is not going to change. And so, what we have to do is we have to change the way that we train our teachers, change the way that we look at our students, and change our thinking when it comes to how we deal with our children of color. Um, white children are much more likely to be picked um, than, than black children and children of color, and so we have to ask ourselves, why is that? It's because when we think about you know, culture, let's be honest, there are some biases that are in place. Um, what we look at, the way we look at kids, the way we critique them, the way we look at the mold, and so I think that for sure, we have to be, begin to and continue to, as um, she stated, make sure that the teachers um, are getting the proper training and that they're getting the proper cultural competencies and knowing how to deal with children that are different than the mold. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Neal. Just uh, two, two things I would share. One, I think it's important to look beyond what the, the spheres of, um, of academia that, that we might be familiar with. So. You know, if, if someone is, you know, interested in poetry and they're creative and they're writing sonnets, that may be something that we're very attuned to and we, we like that and we can understand that. But if they're writing rap, that may not be something that we get. But that is showing creativity. That is showing task commitment and, and you know, potentially could be academic achievement between what the assignment is. So I think it's important just to look to think broadly about what those areas of, of, of work are and so that we can assess that potential giftedness in, in, in all of those areas, because they, they're all very relevant. It may be mechanical, it may be something different than what we see in the classroom. The other thing I would say, and I, I, I say this as a mother, you know, being very attentive to my daughter and making sure that she has, you know, the best opportunities as all parents do. Um, I think it's, it's just important to create and cultivate what we think of as gifted, right? So um, as Thomas just talked about analogies and talked about critical thinking, these are all the kinds of things, and whether you're a parent or a cousin or a big sister or an aunt or an uncle or whoever, those are the kinds of things that we can do to make sure that our children and the, the children that we care about are exposed to those things, they're not put off by them, they're comfortable with them, so that if they come up in the context of a gifted assessment or any, frankly any other kind of assessment, that's something that they can exceed in and excel at. Yes. Ms. McCoy, did you have a comment? Um, I was going to say that, um, one, the mold is broken. Okay. I, we can say underrepresented, but I think it's more underserved. If we're talking about students fitting into a mold in a curriculum that doesn't look like them, and we're judging the fact that they haven't engaged, they haven't dug in, and they haven't, you know, gotten that spark yet, then they're not underrepresented, they're underserved. 
So being able to create a culturally proficient curriculum that engages students differently means that you're going to see those gifts differently. Um, the Junior STEM Academy that we have at UAMS. When I created this camp, I just, I literally wanted to create a camp that my fifth grader at the time would think was fun. I wanted to create a STEM camp that a boy who no, loves nothing but basketball would like to do. But we didn't create a camp, we created a culture. Um, and, and we make that culture representative of the kids that are in that camp. So we have parents that bring their kids and they have a blast and they come back the next year and say, he wanted to go out for GT because he didn't know he liked STEM until JSA. He didn't know that Dr. Dre is an engineer and we need to call him such, right? You know what I mean? Like STEM can seem daunting or being gifted can seem daunting, but um, I don't recall a standardized test that I did well on kindergarten through 12th grade, but UAMS, the largest academic institution in the state pays me to think. So we have to decide that we want to change what that mold is looking like and that the old one is broken. That is so true. And my Great daughter teacher, loves yeah, that nation. program. <laughs> my daughter loves, loves, loves like the Please Sam share all about JSA. Please share. <laughs> Please. <laughs> my daughter has been like three or four years. She loves it. Loves it. Loves it. So kudos to you, Amber. Great Thank program. You. Thank you. My children as well. Okay. Um, any more comments on the traditional GT student and how to approach that differently. Okay. Hey, Jennifer, um, before we move on, I hope I'm not interrupting anyone, but you know, I think our emphasis has to be on meeting a need, a need for a challenge or just the need to help grow our students at not just academically, but in their areas of interest. And so I know our, our field is rapidly changing as we address the structures of everything with COVID-19. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us because yeah. this gives us a stage where we can truly individualize instruction based on student interest and based on student need. So what better time to really start this conversation that we're having tonight and talking about what those needs truly are and how we can truly prepare our students for success in an ever-changing world where we don't know tomorrow what skill sets are really going to be needed for future jobs. So um, at any rate, I just wanted to throw that in there because I think, you know, there's such a stigma about gifted programming um, and um, Amber mentioned, you know, the mold being broken and all of that. But um, with that stigma, I think sometimes we lose the focus that gifted programming is designed to meet a need. And in, through individualization, I think that we can meet so many needs. And again, I think this is our time. This is really our time to shine in gifted ed and truly meeting those needs, whether they be cultural or whether they be socioeconomic, whatever. So, and I'll, I'll hush now. <laughs> Well, that leads us into the next question. Um, so we mentioned the underserved. Um, how can regular and gifted teachers include more diversity in their classrooms to better educate African Americans? Um, we'll start with Miss Stanley on this one. Thank you. The educator uh, coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is actually what I work towards every day. Uh, the resources that I'm creating, um, I am developing a professional development for teachers and going to be teaching that this summer to a couple of co-ops about how to in seamlessly include African-American history into the curriculum, not this extra add-on, this extra month, this, you know, but seeing that representation from day one of school to the last day of school and not feeling like it's extra or less than or exceptional in any negative kind of way, right? Like that this, we'll, we'll talk about this because we got to. No, this is important. The, the perspective of African-Americans um, in history classes, but then in, in all classes, it just doesn't matter. They need to see themselves represented. And so um, that's what I go out and teach to teachers. And um, that's what I hopefully provide as resources for teachers who are wondering, but don't know how. Um, so yeah, like I said, making sure we look at curriculum and frameworks and even if it's not explicit that it says in there, we're going to talk about this, finding that black perspective so that it can be included and both sides, all sides get represented. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to share or add on? 
if we can start as a diversity specialist and inclusion strategist, words matter. And starting with gifted and regular says something all in itself. There's gifted, if you will, and then there's general education. But what are we really saying when we say regular, right? So I think it's being able to acknowledge that we've already decided things about these students when we call them regular and what that re the connotation of what that really means. So, I mean, do I want to engage or do I want to feel like I need to go above and beyond? Because my experience is that children often rise to what's expected of them. I mean, in the in JSA, we don't teach on grade level. We, our second graders, learn nothing less than a fourth grade lesson, right? Our fifth graders, we're doing nothing less than eighth grade. We don't go in and say, all right, second graders, you're going to learn a fourth grade lesson today. We simply teach it. If there's scaffolding or anything that needs to take place, we get them to where they need to be because it's a problem-based curriculum. But we don't go in telling them you're going to this. We simply expect that they're able to learn it. So whether they're gifted or general education, they may be on two different paths. They may have two different curriculums, but I think that calling them regular is something that we should move away from altogether. I don't think any of us like to be called regular. Hey, like who wants to be regular? <laughs> but that was a good point that you brought up that you rise to the occasion of what you're being asked. And if we offer those opportunities a lot more and look at everyone, it's a, it's a mindset change. I think that that was a valuable point there is that it's really truly a mindset change that we need to treat all of our students as gifted students and not prejudge or think that someone can't do it because of how they look. And what a wonderful um, description of having a growth mindset um, in that, you know, and we're enabling you to reach this standard, which we're not even going to talk about what great level it is. We're just going to enable you and, you know, uh, give you the skills that you need to reach that. So I love that. Thank you, Amber. So that leads us into the next question. And this is more of a thought provoking question, but I need for you guys to share an experience that made you feel uncomfortable in your educational career with an educator and speak to what you wish the teacher or professor would have just known or done differently to help you learn or feel more comfortable in that setting. And I mean, this could be anyone on the panel, um, but I know that we all have experiences, but we're trying to reach the, um, if it deals with racism or something that made you feel uncomfortable or either way. So we will start with Ms. Booth McCoy. Um, at North Pulaski, many, many years ago, there were only four black students in the AP class, um, and in the AP classes, if you will, and, and they purposefully would, you know, keep us divided up two and two. Um, and so my senior year, I was in choir and band, or maybe it was 11th grade, band or, um, competitive acting, all of that. The point is, because they had to keep us separate, we had to rearrange the entire 12th grade like block. Like they completely moved where English was gonna be for the other students because we needed to take it. The other um, AP student was a, a basketball player and so we needed it at a different time, right? And so they moved the entire curriculum around and it felt like, it felt like classes are being moved because you're black. <laughs> And it felt like we were being excluded, even though I assume they were trying to be inclusive. And it felt like it was our fault. Teachers were losing a prep period or, you know what I mean? Like all of these things. And so that was a time where I wish that someone would have said, you know what, we just don't have enough black students. We can't keep y'all together. We can't keep all four of you or something. An honest conversation versus the side conversations that were, have, that were being had, um, all of the courses were still being moved and all you essentially knew as a child is that they were being moved because you were black. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I know scheduling and everything is an important part of an educator's task and hopefully all the educators listening will know that. Okay, who would like to go next? I can, I can share something. Um, I remember when we were talking in our, in our prep conversation about this, this, this incident occurred to me um, and it was my senior year in high school. Um, I, can, I can think of other incidents, but this one particularly was very memorable to me because um, 
was a senior in high school. I was taking English at the time. It was called Honors English. Um, and it was world literature. Um, and I was disturbed the entire year because we only studied European writers. And, you know, if it's called world, it should be the whole world. It shouldn't just be Europe. Um, and so that was problematic from the get-go. Um, time came to do our big papers. We had to choose an author to write about. And I was very clear that in this world literature class, I was going to write from somebody who was not European, who was going to be someone from the whole world. And so I asked my teacher if she could recommend an artist from the continent, from, Af from the continent of Africa that I could write, uh, sorry, an artist, an author from the continent of Africa that I could write about. And she told me that there was, she didn't think that there was anyone who was high enough quality whose, whose work would be appropriate for someone who's a senior in high school to write about. And I just, of course, did not accept that as fact. <laughs> could not believe that was true. Thankfully, Willis Oyinka had won the Nobel Prize for Literature just a few years before. So I went back and did that research, found Willis Oyinka, who was from Nigeria, a Nigerian playwright, wonderful um, uh, writer, got to meet him later on when I was in grad school, um, and, wrote, and went back to her and said, can I write about Willis Oyinka? He won a Nobel Prize in Literature. And she said, yeah, I think, I think he'll do. <laughs> it'll work. I should not have had to do that. Um, a, because if it's a world literature class, it should be about world literature. Europeans are not the only ones who can write, who can write creatively, who can write excellent, thought-provoking, complex narratives that tell the stories about the entire human condition. That is not only the privilege of people from Europe. Um, and, and in the case, and obviously that's, that's been some years ago as well, so hopefully that's not the case now in a, in a world literature class, but that was the case when I took it. That should not have been the case. And if you're teaching a world literature class, and even if you're only going to teach, because that's what you're used to teaching, you're too, 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 used to teaching uh, a European canon, you ought to familiarize yourself with folks, particularly those who might have won the Nobel Prize for Literature, um, who could also be uh, appropriate topics for your students to write about. I was pleased that she was receptive to that, and so I did get to write that paper. I, I continue to have Wallace Inc. In my, in my bookshelf right now, in part because of, of that experience. Thank you. I think that all educators should note that as well with expanding their horizons as well, you know, and knowing that, again, that mindset is so important. Who would like to go next about an experience? I have a similar experience that Dr. Neal shared. It's really interesting. It was same, almost the same thing. It was I was a senior and I was in um, forensics theater and, um, you know, there's a box of people that you can choose from to do um, our pearls pieces. And so over the summer we had to practice because we went right into um, performances in the, in the fall. And so I had practiced all summer this particular piece and it was an African-American piece. And so when I got to school, my teacher was so disappointed. She did not want me to pick that piece. She had a, a different piece that she wanted to, she wanted me to um, use that was from a white author and I did not want to use it and so she did not allow me to perform uh, for half of the half of the year because we kind of had a disagreement um, so I don't know whether or not it was because the author was um, black what I do know is that everything that she, out of everything that she had in the box there was no representation of uh, African Americans um, in, in literature and theater and um, I think that it would have been helpful if we would have had the conversation about race because I did tell her I particularly wanted to do that piece because it was an African-American piece. And I think that she didn't want to talk about it. And so I think that's just a point to make that um, teachers cannot be afraid to have the conversation about race, to talk about race. It's very important, um, not only with your black students, but also with your white students uh, as well. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Okay, Mr. Love, or? I'm I was just sitting here thinking about um, an uncomfortable, I mean, the, the question was in regards to uncomfortable educational. Right, in your educational career, whether that was in elementary or secondary or college, what do you wish a professor or a teacher would have known to help make you feel more comfortable about you or about your culture or anything like that? I would say this. Um, well, wow, there's a couple of experiences, but I, I would say um, in, in thinking about this entire conversation, I was um, in AP English in, in junior high, and I ended up, um, we had this hard-nosed teacher, and she was, and she was very hard, very difficult, 
but I can remember her just not being receptive to anything. I was trying in her class and her not even being willing to kind of be in to say, wait a minute, let me step back and and kind of talk this this young person through. Because, you know, uh, as a teacher, I think that you also have to be a cultivator, but I also think you have to be intentional in what you're doing. And so I can remember from that point on, she was like, you know, I think you just need to get out of my class. And I can remember from that point on, as a young person, and I think this happens to, uh, I think this happens to African American males because I've had conversations about this, is that when teachers don't know what to do with you, they just kind of push you out, and and those are the things that actually, you know, I can look back on and I say, you know, I could say, man, I wish this teacher would have took a little more time. Now I know the teacher schedules are busy. But but I think in this entire conversation, the word intentionality needs to be mentioned because if a teacher is being intentional, then they are going to make the progress that you all desire. If they're being intentional, they're going to do those things. And it may be a little extra effort on their part, but I think that we can get to where we want to if they're being intentional. If, if this conversation is just going to be a conversation and it's not going to be intentional, if you don't intentionally want to, uh, if you intentionally want to bring uh, young men of color into the program, then you're going to, you're going to meet that goal. And so when I, when I think about the, the, the conversation we had before when we were started talking about the mold, thinking about that because I was thinking about well what is the criteria because I don't know the T the GT criteria now I heck I didn't even know it then when I was in GT Uh, and is that criteria necessary and we do this with many things in the legislature Uh, you could just look at you know what laws we have in place and we always say well is this criteria necessary in order to qualify that that, that student is a GT student. And so I think in this whole thing, when I look back at this experience, I think about, I wish that my teacher was more intentional in trying to cultivate something within me because I went on and went to GT and my teacher found out that I was talented and gifted and I, and I, and I flourished in her class. But at that time, Ms. Jolliffe was intentional about you know trying to cultivate those things within that within me. And so I think that if your GT teachers are going to be intentional, I think that that you will grow uh, young people of color in your programs. I think that that's going to that that's going to mean that that mode is going to be tossed out. And it, and it doesn't mean that you're going to have to toss that mode out the window. You're just going to have to expand that mode to to say, well, you know, as as Dr. Neal said, I was writing poetry back then, but another student could be writing rap, and it's basically the same thing. And so you're going to have to expand your definition of what creativity looks like. You're going to have to say, is that criteria really necessary to deem this child a, a talented and gifted child? And so I would say that to wrap this up, I would just say intentionality needs to be what you all are, are 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 moving forward on, and if you're intentional, then you're gonna you're gonna meet your goal. Thank you. Um, I do see that we have again that mindset or the relationship that you develop with your students helps you to kind of see deeper inside a student. You don't just see them for the surface, but if you never take time to talk to the child about their interest or they're, maybe if they're having some difficulty or they may not have understood one thing you discussed, that's that time to develop that relationship and actually show that you care. And a lot of times that's how you can begin cultivating. So thank you. Um, Ms. Booth was um, kicked off and she's logging back in right now, but we will go with our next question. And that question is on advanced placement. Um, we know, or if some people say AP and Mr. Um, Love just mentioned that course, um, arena. Uh, well, AP classes, um, 
are given in order to give a student a chance to earn college credit. And well, that's one of the benefits of it. And it has been noted that not many African American teachers or students embrace this option to teach the class or for a student to even partake in the class. And the question is, do you feel that there are stigmas along with taking quote unquote smart classes, or do you feel that students and parents are just not informed? And this is um, important because even within my own household, uh, we were having a family Zoom. And one of my sister-in-law said, how does a student get a 4.5? And I'm thinking, let me tell you, oh, well, let me help you. And it's so many people that are still not informed of all the different opportunities. So I just, uh, everybody on the, um, on this webinar, I just hope that we do better at explaining and letting people know about those opportunities and what AP really means so that we don't shy away from those courses and that we know that that helps a, a child prepare for college even if they don't pass the AP exam from College Board, they still are more prepared for college. And the credit, you, you get a higher weight for your A. You get a 5.0 for your A versus that 4.0. So it's parents, if your students are coming home with a C, don't beat them across the head. They're learning. <laughs> and I think Dustin um, could speak to this as well with the AP classes and that stigma that we're seeing. It's even with AP teachers, we don't have many African-American AP teachers. Ms. Thomas, yeah. let, let me start off with this because I, I ended with AP because and I will tell you um, at that time when I ended up leaving that class, my, my mom was not even aware that I was leaving AP. And so I think that it, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of some things. It's a, a combination of a lack of, of parental understanding in some households and and I would say my mom was very involved in my education. She was very involved in what I did, but um, it was a lack of it, it was it was a little of a lack of, of, of parental involvement in that and, and understanding. But I, I will go back to the same thing: is is that we have to be willing to push the we we have to be willing to push the children and help them understand the benefits of it as well. Because, the, I mean, once that teacher just kind of was like, you need to get out of my class, I was like, oh, okay. And it, it just, it was just like a, a pass. I was like, all right. And from, you know, and from certain, from a certain perspective, I was like, all right, well, I can just do what I can to get through my educational experience. And not until I started meeting teachers that wanted to push me, that I kind of realized, like, wait a minute, what I was missing. And so I think um, it, it, it can be a little bit of both of the, of the parental involvement, but I also think that the teacher has a responsibility to kind of help the, the, the student understand that the benefit that they would, they would get out of staying in GT. Right. It, it takes everybody at the school, everyone in the school to promote AP for someone to know about it. Um, we've had different instances where students would say that maybe the counselors would not necessarily sway them that one way or the other. So that we also have to be mindful of that with who we have talking to our students, making sure that they know that that is um, open, an open opportunity, it's equal opportunity for them to take those courses as well. Definitely. Okay. And if I can chime in here, I just want to clarify, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. Um, advanced placement coursework is, is not considered a gifted program. It is an option that a lot of our gifted students choose to enroll in. But I just want to clarify this because I want everyone to, to know that you do not have to be identified as a GT student to enroll in any AP class. And, you know, communication is always a challenge in getting that word out for us. And we work really hard in the Little Rock School District to try to keep all of our students informed and do that recruitment and, you know, really try to um, persuade our students to give AP a try. Jennifer even um, had, she actually had t-shirts made. We actually have AP ambassadors throughout the school district, which are students that uh, their role is to to just raise that awareness about advanced placement as an opportunity for all students, not just those that are in GT, but for everyone to try out the rigor of a college level course. 
um, which is what an AP course is. And so, yes, it's a great fit for a lot of our gifted kids, but it's open to everyone. And I just wanted to clarify that because we, we just ask everyone to help us get that word out about AP because so many times kids are like, well, I wasn't identified as a GT student I, and feel left out because they weren't included in a gifted program, but yet this is open to everyone. And so we certainly want, um, you know, students to take advantage of, of that opportunity and trying to get that word out about AP. Okay. Anyone else? How do we help with the stigma of, hopefully that, that, that the stigma of don't just take AP because it's the quote unquote smart class or you're acting a certain type of way if you take AP, how do we help with that? That was the question, Ms. Boo. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I still think it goes back to revamping what um, what those classes look like. I was in AP, and um, as far as literature and things like that, like if I'm in meetings, you know, with um, executives, and somebody says there's something rotten in Denmark, then yes, I know where um, where that originated. But as far as being able to not only understand literature, like to be able to see what the classics were in other cultures and things like that. I think that if the curriculum was more reflective of the student body in which it's supposed to represent, then you'd have more students signing up for it. I, I, if I had to go back and do it over again, knowing what I know, not saying that AP wasn't, you know, that it wasn't helpful. What I'm saying is that if I could go back again and I knew that I was only going to read Hamlet, I knew that I was only going to read Shakespeare, I wasn't going to look at uh, literature that looked like me, I don't know if I would sign up for that a second time. So I think that getting students to sign up or getting parents even to sign up, because one thing we know for sure, especially in the black community, is that we talk and we tell. If my child had a good experience in AP, I'm going to tell my black friends. I'm going to be like, girl, you need to get in AP. Well, if my friends are like, I'm just here so I can, you know, make a C and it's a B. Like, well, then that doesn't make me want to get in it. So I think that revamping, again, what that mold looks like and what that curriculum looks like and making it reflective of the student body it's supposed to represent, um, then you, you would not have the problem that you have as far as people wanting to get in the class. Ms. Stanley, thank you. Ms. Stanley. Um, I I just wanted to, to remind everybody and, and maybe tell some of our viewers for the first time that the entire education system, especially the higher education system, was founded hundreds of years ago on elitism, right? It was founded by elites for elites to exclude those that did not belong there, right? And we have not done anything to dismantle that system and it has trickled all the way down to our poor little kindergartners who have to sit for state testing okay and so i think that um until all of that shifts until we see value in those world literature you know like like everybody was sharing so beautifully um until we see value in that until we see value in differing perspectives until we see value in a creativity that is different than the one that we are used to. Um, I don't think we are going to have kids that sign up. I don't think it's a stigma. I, I, I truly don't. I think, you know, you have plenty of kids who want to participate, but the system has worked against them their entire school career to make them think they can't or that they aren't in the know. Like they don't, you know, this, these aren't people I know. This doesn't look like me. This isn't what speaks to me right so of course they're not going to want to participate i like i said i don't think it's a stigma i i think it's a system that is working actively against them so if i could if i could chime in i i definitely took the ap english and and ap history and those things as well but also i was a biologist and and trained as a as a, as a geneticist and so i took a lot of ap science classes as well um, and certainly there are issues there around representation as well. Um, I had a fantastic, I feel like I need to call her out, Anise Stedman, who is a fantastic, um, uh, uh, yeah, she was a wonderful <laughs> biology teacher, um, an AP biology teacher for me. And part of what I think is important, I really want to thank Ms. Shinnable for, for reminding people that AP is open to everyone. I think it's really critical to help people understand what the goals of AP are. 
so that you don't think that you failed if you don't make a five on the test or a four on the test, that that is not a failure, that in fact you are being prepared for college, that you are being prepared to understand how to manage your time appropriately. Um, I remember the, the first year when I taught at the math and science school and I sort of was, was fairly new out, of, new out of college and was really thinking like, we're gonna prepare these kids to go to college and be successful. And we're taking organic chemistry and we're gonna take biochemistry and, and chemistry, you're gonna be prepared to take chemistry in college. That was, that was my goal. I didn't want them to be afraid of that. And so when you know, we, we did homework and we did those things, but their tests were, you know, we had a midterm and we had a final pretty much. We didn't have a whole, bunch, whole bunch of tests throughout the year. We didn't have a whole bunch of homework assignments throughout the year. Part of that was learning how to manage your time, learning how to, to think through what your priorities are, understanding when you need assistance, when you need help, figuring out how to answer. That's a huge part, of, at least what my experience was, was with AP and what I, what I tried to do as a teacher. And I think that can benefit everyone for, in so many ways to figure out how to understand how they learn, how to ask for assistance. I think for so many kids, particularly oftentimes if they're, if they're identified as GT, things may have come easily to them. Um, and if things have come easy to them, you might not know how to work. You might not know how to study because you frankly just haven't had to. It's come easily to you for whatever reasons. And if you can get in a challenging class and hopefully figure that out, how to, how to study, how to work hard um, before you get to college, when you're paying for it, when you're on your own, when you might not have the kind of support that you might have had in a high school experience, that is a huge value. Um, for students. And so I really, the, part of the thing I would say is to really help people think more broadly about what the role of AP is. It is not just to get college credit. Um, it, that's, that was, and I, I know when I took it, that was, I mean, I knew that was an option, but I actually wasn't even sure that the college that I was applying to would accept it. I just, it wasn't even, I just was like, I just need to take a rigorous class. I need to be in the most rigorous classes there are. Um, and that's, that's what I hope my daughter will think as well. And so, you know, that is, I think that's just really critical. Um, to expand that definition of what success is in AP. And if I can just add to that, if I may, um, being at UMS, I get what's going to be most likely your gifted and talented in your AP kids after they've gone through 12 years of, you know, 13 years of uh, schooling and then undergraduate and all of that. And then they get into these professional schools and they struggle because they've been high performing all this time. They've been high performing in elementary, they've been high performing in college, and now we need to think on a different level. The just thought that we're building is different. And the way that you think about these things, right? Like you were talking, it's more than just college credit. They teach you how to think critically, they teach you how to analyze certain things. And we have to take med students and go back and teach them reading, like literally, you know, how to break down a paragraph and such. So I definitely think that we need to reimagine what those students look like. <laughs> we need to um, make sure that regurgitating information isn't called gifted when it's mediocre. Like, I just think that we need to <clears throat> reassess all of that. You guys have really said a mouthful and I hope everyone is taking this in. It is it's wonderful discussion. Um, to continue on with this wonderful discussion, um, the term culturally responsive is used in efforts to empathize or better respond to various cultures other than your own. Why would you say this training is valuable to the community and in the educational sector? I'm gonna let someone just go. Well, I'd say that it's <laughs> valuable. <laughs> Um, I think it's valuable because one, I believe it was um, Dr. Neal that was talking about how the workforce is not reflective of the student population. <clears throat> so it is going to be necessary for me as an educator to educate myself on the population that I serve, how to reach those students, how to best enlighten those students. And the onus is on the teacher, right? So because the intrapersonal work is what makes the difference. If we have a, a district where uh, black boys only make up, you know, a certain percentage, you know, of the population, but they make up 80% of the disciplinary actions taken, well, all of them can't be bad, right? So we need to make sure that what are the cultural differences aren't being looked at as behavior problems. And that's why culturally responsive or understanding culturally responsive information is necessary. If I look at myself, I grew up in a house where my father told my sister and I, we had to think, this is what like, you think. And you could say, if my mother said something, I could say, I beg to differ. And depending on how she felt that day, she would allow us to plead a case, right? So if that's my upbringing, 
That's my home. And I, at my home, children are allowed to think, they're allowed to share and express that to adults. You don't always get to be right. I get to share my opinion. And then I go in the classroom and what looks to be insubordination is really me talking like I do at home because I'm allowed to think. That's cultural. That has nothing to do with behavior. So culturally responsive teaching is going to be the acknowledgement of, I don't know everything. It involves cultural humility and it involves being willing to take a look at how you process certain things, your own biases, because they're going to play out in that classroom. Yeah, I think that um, when you mentioned that your parents had you be a thinker, um, I think that sometimes in, in different trainings I've been in, they've said that African-American culture don't allow you to talk. So I think that that brings out a good point that every African-American is not the same. Not, my not all raised the same, just like any Caucasian is not raised the same <laughs> or anybody else. Right. We all have different households. Mm -hmm. So it does behoove you to try to learn that student and develop that relationship, but still have that knowledge as a professional and know how to use that knowledge and use it effectively. So thank you. Because, I mean, that's a great point. You know, it, we come from so many different types of backgrounds. And I would hate that a teacher would look at you and say, well, she's not going to talk because she's African-American or she's Hispanic. But your parents had you think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anyone else like to comment on why it is important to have a cultural responsive, um, really trained teacher? I just want to chime in. This isn't quite, um, it's just kind of a bit of a tangent off of your question, but I do think it's an important point. We've been talking about inclusivity and diversity among teaching and thinking about, you know, the kinds of curriculum materials. And I think sometimes that's presented as being necessary for the Black student, for the Hispanic student, for the Asian student, for the woman student, um, but it's really for everyone. And I think that's really, really a critical point because it's not a favor that you're doing, that someone's doing for this particular subgroup of students. It's really, uh, it's, it's responsibility to all students. As students grow and as our world changes, people are gonna have to be, they're gonna be in a position where their boss is someone who doesn't look like them. Where they're gonna be in a higher, their hiring manager is gonna be someone who doesn't look like them, who might be a little bit different from them, who might think a little bit different, might have a different set of experience, a different set of canon from them. And everyone, all of us are going to have to be trained and be in a situation where we can be responsive, where that doesn't freak us out, where we don't freeze in that situation where we know how to interview with someone, regardless of whether they're a woman or whether they're a person of color or whoever, we can deal with that and we can be fine with that and we can succeed and show ourselves. And I think it's really critical that in the context of GT education, really all education, that we recognize these, this issue of, these issues around diversity and inclusivity are not specific to folks of color, specific to women. They are, they are really important for everyone, for all students. Yeah, Ms. Stanley, thank you, Dr. Neal. Yeah, I would like to agree with that. And it's it's interesting actually to hear what everybody has said because um, for me, in my opinion, and from my perspective, I feel like <laughs> African-Americans don't necessarily need that cultural sensitivity training because they are constantly sensitive <laughs> of a different culture and what they are going to expect and do and say and not say and not do. So I feel like the white community needs to take on a much larger uh, portion of this burden to become aware of not only how we see things as normal and abnormal or different, right? I mean, it's not, um, it's not something that I had ever considered as a kid, right? Or even in college or even, you know, when I first got into the workforce that, I needed to consider anybody else's perspective because most people had my perspective, right? And so not having to face that, not having to meet that head on and talk about, okay, you know, you, you are not the only voice in this room, even though there are lots of people that are standing with you, right? I, it's, that's, it's, a, it's a thing that I'm still continuing to learn, still continuing to work on, still continuing to try to be better about because I feel like, um, I feel like the white community is not taught to even be aware that we're doing it, right? We, are, we aren't even aware of those things that we do that are culturally insensitive or 
racist or, you know, any kind of discriminatory. I, I think that it's a burden that we need to take up a bigger portion of, hopefully. <laughs> yes, thank you for the input. Ms. Shinnable, did you want to say something? Well, I just agree with all the comments that have been made um, and the um, expressions from uh, Dr. Neal and Amber. And, you know, I just think we have to enter into this conversation with a lot of grace and a lot of effort to understand each other. Because as Kristen said, you know, um, I don't think we, near enough of that is spread around. And, um, you know, just seeking to understand. I know there's there's a quote about seeking to understand and listen before you speak. And I, I think that just needs to kind of be our motto moving forward, uh, whether it be about gifted education or any a conversation about meeting the needs of students um, or or us as educators for that for that matter, because we have a need, we have a growth need as educators to continue understanding other people's perspectives. And um, I just think, you know, building those relationships, as you mentioned, Jennifer, earlier with your students, that, that extends far beyond just your students. You have to be able to build those relationships with your coworkers. Jennifer and I work in an office together and we're very tight spaces, aren't we, Jennifer? <laughs> so there are days that we talk about uncomfortable things and try to understand each other. And I just think we have have to work very hard wherever we're planted to um, to try to hold those hard conversations and not stray away from them and trying to gain that understanding of each other and I think that's what this whole conversation really boils down to tonight um, and meeting the needs of all of our students especially those that are african-american um, because we know there's a disparity there and we know that we've not always met those needs we've not always individualized and we've not always recognized cultural um, things with regard to our students. So, um, you know, it's an ongoing effort. And as we said before, this is just starting our conversation. So um, thank you guys for everything you've shared because I'm hearing your heart. And I think we're all here tonight because we want to make a difference in the lives of others, whether that be students or enabling those in the workplace after they finish K through 12 education to be successful um, in, in their lives, you know, calling. Okay, so Ms. Stanley sort of mentioned this when she was talking about how the um, the basis of education, how it was built. Um, and our, I know we are very um, cognizant of the time that it is now 8.02 and we don't want to keep you any longer. But we'll end with this last question. Um, it says, while teachers may not be racist, because we don't want, we're not calling everybody racist by us discussing this. But while teachers may not be racist, we cannot deny that a system that has been created to be selective lends itself to having barriers for certain groups to access education. What do you suggest teachers, parent representatives, and district and state leaders do to work collaboratively to prevent these barriers? And really think on the, um, on the subject of the whole movement with Black Lives Matter and all of that as well. Um, how would you just start the school year new? Like we can't start the way that it's been. We know we can't go back. We have to move forward. So with knowing how that system is built, knowing what has been said today, um, what, do you, what do you feel like we all could do to help prevent these barriers? I guess I would start off with saying, I mean, I, and I think, I think it's been reiterated. I think number one, we need to listen more. I think so many times that we go into planning, and, and I can tell you as a, as a legislator, we go in planning with the best intent, but we haven't really listened to the community's needs. So if you're, if you're talking about the Hispanic community and, and what is best for the Hispanic community, I think you need to begin with, you know, or let's just put, you, you want to attract more Hispanic students into GT. Well, I think the first thing that you need to do is I think you need to have a conversation with the Hispanic community and have an ongoing dialogue. And, and I, I think far too many times we try to plan something for for our persons and we haven't talked to them first. We haven't really taken the time to really get into their needs. And so I think we're going to have to begin to actually talk more we're going to actually have to give up some autonomy and that's the scary thing is like you know people don't you know people want to listen 
so far, and then they're like, all right, this is getting scary. You know, you're stepping into my box, so and I, we're going to have to give them some autonomy. And I think that's going to be the beauty of it. You can't be scared to have the conversations so that we may be able to move the needle. And so I think that there's going to be a combination of us listening and then really taking those those um, suggestions into heart and then implementing them. And then last but not least, I would just go back to being intentional about doing it. Because I mean, with without the intentionality, I mean, nothing's gonna, nothing is going to occur. So I, I'm gonna say you have to be intentional. So you're gonna have to have, as you said, the uh, uh, Miss Shinnable said, you're gonna have, you're gonna be in tight, tight quarters. You're gonna have those hard conversations. But besides having those hard conversations, then what are you gonna do to act on? Them? And so I think that's, I think that's gonna be the culmination of, of how you're gonna actually be able to attract more students, move the needle forward on these things is you're going to have to listen, you're going to have to give your autonomy up, and then you're going to have to also be intentional about doing this. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fletcher. I think that um, similar to what Ms. Kristen, what Ms. Stanley said is that we have to recognize that the whole foundation of everything in America is based on um, an environment that favors white culture. And so I think acknowledging that first, right? So we have to acknowledge that that's where we are. But then we have to figure out, okay, how do we move from a place of that? Um, and so what that means, as um, Representative Love said, is being very intentional about the next steps that we make. It's very tiring at times being the only, having the person speaking up, being the person of color. And so because over 80% of the teachers are white, right, we have to have more white people, as Ms. Stanley said, speaking up um, and, and, and kind of saying, you know what, like this is enough. We want representation. We want equal. We want equity. Let me flip that over. We don't want equal. We want equity. And so equity is different than equality. It's not how all are equal. It's how do you give this baby whose mom works all day, who he's hungry, how do we make sure that what he receives is equitable so that he can be considered for, um, you know, GT or AP or whatever those classes are. So we have to take into consideration that your black and brown kids, um, they, there's, there's a huge gap right there. So how do we make sure things are equitable for them? And that does take, like Representative Love says, having those conversations and doing that work. And so people who truly say that they're allies, that they really do want to change, then going back into the classroom on day one, you have to go in with a fresh look saying, okay, yeah, not only that I know it's a problem, but I'm going to use my voice, right? We all have privilege, not just white privilege, we all have privilege, but how am I going to use that privilege to be able to help others? And that means that our white teachers have to be more vocal, um, have to step up. It can't always be the black administrators, the black teachers, you know, the black students, the black parents, because then it's like, oh, they're always complaining. They're always whining. They always have to have, they always have a problem. We have to have more allies in it. And then not just one white teacher stepping up, two, three, four, five, six, as many as you can coming together, right, for, with community, stepping forward saying, hey, this is a real problem. We want to see more kids. These are some ideas. These are some solutions that we put in place to be able to help our, our children of black and brown um, color. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to have any closing statements? Okay. Well, I appreciate all of you today, and I hope that everyone will take in all that was said and that this is only the beginning. Um, we hope to have more webinars. Um, this month, actually, they're going to have a webinar dealing with writing college essays, college entry essays. But we will come back to this topic, hopefully um, in August. And we would love to invite some of you back if you are interested. And it can be a part two. Okay, so thank you for your time today. And Mr. Seaton. Yeah, you thank you, Ms. Thomas. Out. Thank you for the panelists for joining us today. In the chat box, I did put in... Um, Ms. Thomas's emails, if there are any follow-up questions that you would like to, to address, or if there are future panel discussions that we'd like to do. But I also put in the uh, drive, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has put out a 2020 curriculum. And so it's in the Google Drive uh, that I shared in the chat. Uh, it is a great starting point that I think it, 
I, I've already been approached by GT students over the summer of how can we carry on the conversation and be intentional and purposeful in, in the, the curriculum of what we're teaching our kids for the fall. And I think that's a great starting spot. So even though we just started the conversation, I wanted to make sure we left you with some resources uh, for, for launching and, and starting the next step. So again, thanks for the panel tonight. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for doing a, a wonderful job moderating. We appreciate y'all. Uh, and thank y'all for, for joining us for our thank first Thank you for panel. asking us to join. Thank you for having me. All right, thank y'all. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Great to meet you guys.